the traditional owners and I'd like to pay my respects to all their elders past, present and emerging and also to mention that because we are zooming out across the country we are zooming out onto the lands of many different Aboriginal people around Australia and I'd like to pay my deepest respects to their elders as well. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never seen it. Storytelling land and so we're continuing that tradition tonight with a little bit more storytelling um, from the wonderful Felix Calvino, who has launched all of his books, I think, so far here, and um, who is now launching another one tonight. So before we get started, if you have your mobile phone with you, if you could switch it to silent, that would be great. Um, and also um, for the people here in the room, we have um, toilets that are available. If you go straight through there in the very corner, there are some toilets out there that are the easiest to access. And... And um, also, if you haven't already um, seen the book at the moment, um, Young Love is front and centre at the front of the counter. And um, also Felix's backlist of books are there as well if you want to have a look at them. Christmas is coming. It's always good to get a signed copy of a book to, to purchase. We do have copies of um, Melissa's books arriving in hopefully soon. Um, we have a very um, strange situation with deliveries at the moment in Australia. You may have seen it on the news and we seem to be the victims of um, very, very slow um, delivery services across the country. So they will be on the way and will probably arrive you know, Christmas Eve or something. So um, if you do want to order a copy, you're welcome to um, do that and we'll put it aside when they arrive through. So um, without further delay, oh, sorry, for the people on Zoom, welcome to the people who have arrived on Zoom. And um, what I'm going to let you know is that there's a chat function. We're just about to send through a link where you can purchase the book of the moment on the chat function. And that chat function is where you can type in questions to Felix at any time during the um, discussions tonight. And I will uh, be able to read them out uh, and so Felix will be able to answer your questions. So it will be a remote Q&A as well as an in real life Q&A. And tonight is the last in real life Q&A where you won't have to check in using your vaccine passports. So um, for future events with Avid Reader until the um, rules change, we will have to check your vaccine certificate on the way through after um, from tomorrow on. So just to let you know in advance that that's happening so you can get, get it organised on your phone. And then you won't miss an event, but there is always Zoom. Great. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Melissa Ashley, who is a writer, poet, birder and academic. who tutors in poetry and creative writing at the University of Queensland and um, has published a collection of poems, short stories, essays, articles and books. She is the author of The Bird Man's Wife and The Bee and the Orange Tree, both of which are incredibly beautiful books and um, both of which would have made a fantastic Christmas present, so make sure you order them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll pass you over to Melissa. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Chrissy. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. It's my absolute honour and delight to speak a few words tonight about Felix Calvino, of the brilliant new collection of short stories, Young Love, which is right there. So I first met Felix when we were postgraduates at the University of Queensland. Uh, according to Felix, one day I came out of my supervisor's room sobbing 
which I don't actually remember. But I do remember that I was struggling at the time and Felix told me to come with him, said we could go for a walk. So we bought coffee and we drank in the fresh air and the bright sun and this became our daily habit. So both Felix the man and Felix the author are excellent guides in finding practices, little daily observances that break down periods of being stale, tired or stuck. And both Felix's need connection and friendship. So ritual and fraternity are central themes in Felix's stories. And as proof, I have a lovely quote by him. He puts it far more eloquently than I ever could. He's really a poet. Um, and it's a quote from the first story in Young Love. And the story is called Sunday Lunch. I said that what was good for him was good for me. We walked on under a low, bright moon. We took the long way around, avoiding the village, to reach the Hernandez watermill at the foot of the hills where the river is born. So I'd already read a handful of cherries that came out in 2007 before I met Felix. And I was very much in awe of his talents and very thrilled when he befriended me. He's one of the most generous people I know and he's taught me an awful lot about writing and about life. Be kind to yourself, practice, persevere, have faith. If you need a change in scenery when you're bogged down, offer a coffee and a walk. And I observed all this while I was at university with Felix in his lived example. He toiled over the collection he wrote his degree for, So Much Smoke, not unlike the rye threshing and wheat grinding manual labourers he was writing about. I'd always ask Felix about how his book was coming along and he would shake his head very dramatically and he always kind of gave me the same answer. I'm writing it again. I'm having a tough get. I'm having a tough day. It's progressing very, very slowly. I love Felix's Philip Roth, James Joyce perfectionism, but it's all a humble front, genuinely though. So Felix has a work ethic of stone. So along with a hat full of cherries and so much smoke, Felix has also published a novel, Alfonso, but tonight we're here to celebrate the release of his fourth book, the short story collection, Young Love. So Young Love has six short stories, and they explore the demise of, it's never named, but the Galician village that Felix grew up in. So if you read Felix's stories, you'll be familiar that this is a literary place and a place of the imagination and of memory that he returns to over and over in his stories. Do you want me to? Sorry. That was turned off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. So In Young Love, which Felix tells me is the hardest book he's ever written, um, a eulogy is created for the village, former inhabitants, its centuries of tradition, the failure of its actions of its youth and families. There's nothing left, Felix says to me when I ask him about it. He gives a wistful shrug and he looks at me and his eyes convey so much more than a long and wordy explanation for it. So Galicia is a coastal region in the northwest of Spain. It has its own language and for centuries it's been one of the poorest regions of the country. Waves of migration pepper its history, beginning in the 19th century and continuing into the mid 20th century and beyond. Felix himself left Galicia in 1964 at 20 years of age to escape military service. So Felix uses a character called Manuel and he features in five of the stories in Young Love as a metaphor for the demise of the village. We first meet him and he's in his 70s in a story called Sunday Lunch. And we're also introduced to him in the next story and he's at his youngest, which is 14 years of age and it's 1939, the end of the Spanish Civil War and it's during the period of Franco's authoritarian rule 
which lasted until the mid 70s and um, resulted in mass migrations of Spanish out of the country. And when we leave Manuel, he is literally the last man standing in the village. Um, he has a limp and he, it's just him and his new puppy, Mateo. So Felix mostly writes in the short story genre, which is one of pressure, economy, strong themes and repercussions. It's a completely different beast to the novel, which relies upon the coherence of plot to bring all the ribbons of a narrative into in short, thoughts, experiences of a character can be singularly explored and examined. The consequences of a choice or an event stripped down to the barest of essentials. The narrative arrangement of young love is particularly compelling in that all of the stories speak to each other. In this vein, Felix is similar to Alice Munro or Elizabeth Strout, who've written collections that span the lives of a particular character but don't follow a plot, rather a series of events and images and memories in the short stories. So I'll make a little aside here and advise you that you do need to read Felix's collection from beginning to end. It's not chronologically ordered, but just like Adele in her latest album, she may Spotify stop people being able to randomly listen. It's very important that you read Felix's new collection in order because he's thought very carefully as the artist that he is about the order in which everything's been put. So the first story in um, Young Love is called Sunday Lunch and it begins on the day of a weekly meal shared by three characters, Armado, Avelina and Manuel. They're loosely friendly, they're in their 70s and um, they're the last three inhabitants of the village. And they get together once a week for Sunday because Evelina has. So Sunday lunch is an allegory. It's a metaphor for um, Felix's theme of the death of the village. And the character Manuel personifies and embodies the complex reasons for the end of the village. Um, so we discover in the story that the three of them have carried on the tradition in the village of preparing the dead for burial. Um, Evelina dresses the dead. Um, Manuel makes the coffins, Amadeo informs the relatives. <laughs> so what Felix does is he concretizes the absoluteness of the abandonment of the village by its former inhabitants by closely describing the process of preparing for this funeral in which the town has emptied out and the normal observances, the normal rituals can't be carried out. So the coffin can't be carried to the graveyard and it must be assembled by the men there in the graveyard. So Felix uses very powerful imagery to convey one of the major regions, reasons for the village's demise, which is poverty brought about by the failure to modernise its agricultural economy. And I have lots of beautiful quotes from Felix in this talk. One of my vivid memory of, this is from Sunday lunch, one of my Vivid memories of her is growing consternation on her face when adding a piece of salted pork from the pig killed at Christmas to the vegetable soup and how the piece got smaller and smaller from month to month. That was only one of the things that measured the nightmare of poverty she had to contend with every day of her life. As with Felix's other books, he's a master of the compressed metaphor. He combines a striking visual image with an arresting subtext or inference. So here's another incredible imagery um, that he's made in Sunday Lunch, which I think will always stay with me. It's a little, little bit of dialogue um, between the two men who are about to bury um, their friend. Do you ever smoke? No, but you know how smokers roll their cigarettes. I do. Manuel proceeded to wrap her light and small body with great care. Both the sheet and the blanket were sufficiently wide to wrap her twice and long enough to tuck in her head and feet. So Felix's narrators are at heart solitary, kind, stoic and very fatalistic. Both Manuel and Abel, who's a young orphan uh, in the story Abel's Journey, is treated very poorly, moved around the village from home to home. These men internalise their suffering 
They ruminate and meditate upon yearning to meet a woman, a desire for connection. So a major theme in Felix's work is self-imposed solitude, the dignity in this, its deep and private longing. The narrator in Sunday Lunch provides a clue that perhaps the inner life of one is more authentic, that we cannot judge from the self we present to others. And here's a quote. He then remembered the education. He then remembered the educated saying that in every man and woman was an internal and external individual. The external one was just appearance, while the inner was reality. Talks often cheap for Felix's characters, and readers are taken on a journey into their inside lives, their confusion, desires, their suffering, and the transcendence and joy they experience when perhaps a moment exposes a coherent thread connecting everything in Sunday lunch. Once or twice, the men looked at one another and returned to the food the tasks ahead, although in their minds were not mentioned. Uh, in the story Abel's journey, the young Abel, he's actually Felix's his kind of most abject, discarded character in the book. Um, he's abandoned as a child. He doesn't know who his mother is and he's shunted from home to home. Later in life, um, just when he thinks everything's working out, he develops an eye condition that may seem loose all his vision. And so Felix talks about um, how he internalises things and how he grows to accept and live with them. This is the quote. In this carnival of frustrations, Abel retreated into himself, into protective silence. He became sparse with his words and rarely expressed his opinion. In any case, decisions had always been made for him and arguing with decisions had been counterproductive. He felt, no, he felt no animosity towards anyone. It was simply the way things were and he could only get used to it. In the story Young Love, uh, we meet Manuel at the age of 14 and he's living off the glances that he shares with a girl in his class, Amelia. And this is an experience we can all relate to and remember having an intense crush that's made of projection and It's tender, fragile, might be a delusion in terms of how the other person feels. But this is where Felix is very different. Um, he shows his elusiveness, his uncanniness, and, and a little bit of magic realism and, and, and the psychic that comes through. Because in Young Love, the beloved Amelia and Manuel, their feelings are in sync, even though they don't speak to one another. So here's a, a description of Felix does interiority so beautiful. So here's a description from Amelia of what she thinks of him and her feelings. But in her actions, there was a higher purpose than just giving a compliment. He had stirred feelings in her well before her friends of the same age had begun to take an interest in boys. Initially, it was curiosity. As it seemed to her, he avoided being noticed. Then she liked the way he walked, his pleasant face, the soothing tone of his voice. He would not be much taller than her, which was fine. And he was given to speak when it mattered, unlike most other boys who talked all the time and said nothing. Through Manuel, the reader tenderly rediscovers these emotions and they're distilled by Felix into the speech of the heart and the speech of the body. The language is Chris, perhaps a nod to Hemingway or Beckett. There's a modernist minimalism in his writing. He very clearly and very gently delivers his knowledge, his exploration of youth and nostalgia. So a, an important theme in Felix's books is an exploration of the conservative traditional, as in his previous writing, he keeps circling back to this, to the Catholic customs, and his characters sift through what's useful and um, discard practices that perhaps bring about added suffering. So many of the characters in all of Felix's books are children and adolescents and they're still discovering their identities. They're questioning received practices and they're sloughing off or undermining customs and attitudes that show little evidence of being good or true. And when the judgment of the community is harsh or cruel or scapegoating or vilifying, Felix addresses the injustices. 
And I think he's a really brilliant little little um, image from Felix about that very thing. It's Amelia is thinking this, and it's from young love, and she's thinking about what happens if she doesn't conform to the um, villagers' expectations of her. She had her aunt to thank for it. Desires, setbacks, confusion are part of her life, and you must have a place to escape to in rough times. She had said that to her once. She liked her aunt very much, a failed nun, a failed in Felix's writing. He takes pains to show the characters quiet desperation, which is made bearable by their routines and their rituals, by acts of grace and kindness, by conviviality, and particularly the pleasures of sharing a meal. And here's a, a quote that's exemplary of um, the beautiful textual concrete writing that Felix does about eating and getting together. On the grinding stone, covered with a tablecloth. There was a wicker, a wicker basket containing wine, cheese, bread, salami, tins of this and that. In one corner, there was a bed of hay and blankets. This is a bit I'm excited about. Felix is also very, very funny in a sly and clever way with many different layers. This is an image from Abel's journey and it's absolutely wonderful and quite typical of Felix. They were in bed, lying on their backs in matching white and blue. Christina had made them in the pattern of prison uniforms from a roll of half of the cloth was still on a roll, standing behind the door in her sewing room. Occasionally, it reminded them of ill fated inmates serving long sentences. And here's another one from the story Beekeeping. The Queen Bee had his respect, a life of, res of responsibility and progeny. The humble worker bee had his affection, a brief life of relentless toil, beginning with cleaning out the cell in which he was born. As for the drones, we only have to mate, but otherwise never do a day's work. He does not care for them. I sometimes think Felix the author is a philosopher, a psychologist even. He practices in all of his characters an unconditional love, an unconditional positive regard, and it's very freeing. It's an opening up rather than a shutting down. So readers and characters can deeply explore topics that are perturbing, confusing, that draw people in. His narrators are humble and self-effacing, but his prose succeeds in the promise of the best literature which is that it shows us who we are. It underscores our common humanity. It's respectful, and perhaps most of all, and maybe this is me, it brings incredible comfort and affirmation. This is what we do. This is who we are. This is. He does all that work for us. His wisdom prevented like a lunch shared with friends. The wine's been salad, the cheese matured, the bread leavened, the salami is perfectly smoked. It awaits our enjoyment with a friend, cooked, prepared, served. So I can't recommend more highly Felix's beautiful collection of short stories, Young Love. Buy it, read it, tell your friends about it, introduce it to your reading groups, gift it for Christmas. You'll be better for it, I guarantee. In these strange times, Felix's prose comforts us. 
reminds us of our permission to be what we are, flawed and human, and hope in the texture, beauty, light, habits and connections of our day-to-day -day existence. For all this, I'll add one final comment, which is that Felix is also something of an enigma, both the writer and the man. A central mystery is at the heart of all of his works. He shows us that while we're noble in many ways, there are also parts of us that are, that are not, and that's just the way it is. So I'm absolutely honoured to declare your book, Felix, Young Love, well and truly launched. Congratulations. <laughs> You might need to be up a bit more. Hello? 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 Good afternoon. Thank you, Melissa. I'm she referring to my twin brother. <laughs> also a writer. And sometimes a little confusion. But thank you. Good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, again, many of you will come to visit the first time in 2007. Actually, it's a new many man launched that first book. Then again in 2012, and again in 2018. Your presence was priceless for a writer to know that there are readers waiting for his new, his new work is the best antidote against the hours, days, even weeks of poor creativity and uncertainty. This book was most difficult to write. Although I came into the business of writing some 20 years ago, the source of many of my stories go further back in time. The genesis of the first story, titled Sunday Lunch, took place when I was eight or nine years old. And together with other children, we were watching two men digging a grave. It was slow work in the, in the beginning because the ground was frozen. Two white things appeared, they were bones, and one man made it light comments, and the other gently tied the den in a corner. When a large skull came rattling on the shovel, everyone was very quiet. When large bones began to show up, we, the children, were sent away. I carried that image of that grave for a very long time. And the grave needed a cadaver, and I needed information about her or him while they were alive. Various incidents over the years gave me the old material I needed. Some 10 years ago, I decided to write it, but when I tried, I could not find the right words. Another, I had another serious attempt in 2015, and the same thing happened. Then, last year, I wrote it just in a month. After that, it was a matter of rewrite and cut it down, take out the you know, bits and pieces that do not contribute to, to, to the story. The other story I want to mention is Abel's Journey, the longest piece in the collection. The best of it is also took place in my youth. There was a young boy, an orphan, being kicked out from one family to another, like the discard of the soccer ball. I spent many years thinking about and rewriting it, I want Abel's story to be told from multiple perspectives and through both interior and exterior dialogues. I want the reader to see Abel's condition from his perspective as well as have him revealed through Asuncion, the healer, and women such as Adela and Rosalia. Those commentators have a great deal of information about Abel's condition to the start of the reality of a man's life that's been changed forever by incipient blindness. 
But I shall not go further. This is not a place for the discussion of the wings of creativity. Although I must add that while gathering and selecting and weaving material is another story in itself. And while doing it with a pretty, I can perhaps answer some questions if I, if I can. I read from the first story, Sunday lunch. And one stood in the doorway of the kitchen and asked, What are you cooking that smells so good? Steward Patrick with herbs and new potatoes. Another one said, Without looking from the kitchen bench where he was chopping parsley with a large knife. Have you seen Adelina? I saw her a few days ago. She said that she was making a cake to mark the occasion. What occasion? She did not say. Manuel, Amadeo, and Evelina were the three remaining inhabitants of the remote village of Carvalho. The men were both 77, fragile, lean, and of average height. The only physical characteristics distinguished them was that Manuel walked with a noticeable lean on his right leg due to an accident in his youth. Evelina was seven years younger, short and slim, with a round face and black eyes. Their relationship, although they had lived and shared in all aspects of the village life, had never been a close one. Even now, in their old age, their interactions were limited to a few inconsequential remarks if they happened to meet as they went about their everyday uh, activities. The exception to this courteous yet transversal behavior was today Sunday lunch. It had started with coffee, bread, and cheese, following the burial of Generosa several years earlier, the last village of woman, but for Avelina. They had taken turns doing the cooking until Amadeo said that cooking relaxed the him. And one contributed to the fresh bread and game. And Evelina about homemade biscuits, trout, and eel when in season. Manuel stepped inside and took a loaf of bread out of his canvas bag he was carving and sat down at his usual place. Amadeo brought him bread, a breadboard, and a knife and said, Lunch is ready. Where is Evelina? She is punch, always punctual. Too punctual sometimes. I would rather cook alone than have her silent gazing at what I'm doing. Perhaps she forgot the time. Should I fetch her? Do you mind? To be the spring sun was pleasant, Manuel thought as he walked down the narrow village streets, void of human sounds. Yet he was, he felt uneasy. This was not a new sensation. He had experienced it before when passing the front door of one family or another. But today it was everywhere. He did not look up at the windows of empty rooms. He was aware of how the light would affect upon the glass, would play tricks with his mind, to produce living faces, even the voices of men, women, and children who had once inhabited the houses. The village stood at the slope of a small hill with the church and cemetery at the top. The Venus house was, was at the lower end. It was a small stone structure with a kitchen on the ground floor and two bedrooms above it. And to the back of the was a stable, a barn and an array of sheds around the small courtyard. A bird came level of Avelina's kitchen window and called out her name. He knocked on the floor on the door but got no answer. Had she gone to Amadeo's house by, by, by a back alley and they had missed each other. He was about to turn back, but changed his mind and walked on and knocked on the door again. He waited a few minutes and went in. Evelina was sitting quiet in a rocking chair with a mysterious expression on her face. The wood fire had long gone out. A strip of sunlight came through the small window. For a moment, Manuel stood there, stunned, staring at her, for he knew instantly that she was dead. 
Where is she? Your mother asked to bash you in the kitchen. She's gone, replied Manuel. On where? To the beyond. You are being funny. And then he's dead, and then. For a minute or two, and then he's standing up to the ceiling, dims, up to the stone floor, out to the window. He walked to the earth and cast all to the table and sat down opposite Manuel. Your dog was falling last night, and I will say. Yes, Manuel, said Manuel. Was it important? I would not dismiss it. They served themselves small portions and did not speak. Manuel, although heavily touched by ravages of death and those close to his heart, had never expected Avelina's death. A bit of confusion he felt that her passing still had a grief on him. Manuel followed the initial shock of losing a friend and a neighbor, was already half unconsciously thinking of his duties as the village grave keeper, an occupation that had defined his entire life. After they finished eating, Amadeo put away the remain, remaining potatoes and cartridge casserole in a cover in the wall. Manuel cleared the table. They left soon after. In Medina's kitchen, the sun had moved on. It was dark, and Manuel switched on the ceiling light. Amadeo stood for two or three minutes, looking fixedly at Avelina's face. He lifted one of her hands, resting on the lap, and put it back. Then he turned the fucking chair to face the window and sat on the wooden bench by the wall, still gazing at her. Manuel joined him. She has been dead for many, many hours, Amadeo said. The body is no longer fidget. Sometimes after breakfast yesterday, I think, Manuel said, the bread and the honey jar are still on the table, and with the flour, and with the bowl with the eggs for the cake she never made. She was more attractive than when she was alive, Amadeo said. Perhaps that's what, is, what we see is a reflection of her soul. Mareo was silent. The souls of the departed were a matter for the priest. His concerns was with their physical remains. He had seen many dead faces. His father believed that there was a code of the message in each. Perhaps that he was not the decipher of codes. As for Avelina's surprising transformation, he, only, he had only seen it once in a young child. He should take her upstairs. And let's say, to bring her down again, the mother replied. That they moved her to the table. They both stood and approached her. After a moment of hesitancy, Manuel tilted the head slightly forward and placed his arms under hers as if an embrace from behind. And they put one arm under her back and the, head, and the back of her knees and the other under her feet and they lifted her to the table. And well held her in sitting position while the mother went into the bedroom upstairs to fetch a pillow and a blanket. They stood for a while on either side, looking at her wonders and epigmatic face. And well placed a light blue blanket up to her chin. I would cover her face also, and they said, why, my well asked me, it is the custom. was a silence. And then Manuel said, I should go home and feed Matteo. You do that, Mother replied, and I will keep up the leftovers from lunch for our dinner. Perhaps something else. It's going to be a long night. <coughs> they left the house together and parked the company on the stone fountain where all the street lanes of the village converge. Some stars were already out in the early uh, evening sky. And well observed. He then lowered his eyes to the ground in front of him. It was the hour of neither day nor night when shadows malformed or imagined appear from nowhere silently. 
Siadłszy i głowy, przyszły majki twój brady, czyli są. I got my day with me, my Lord said, when they taught each other my day of my later, he took the same place at the table as lunch time and helped himself from St. Castle. And well said with Matthew, some potatoes, but rich breasts after checking for bones. Once or twice, the men look at one another and return to the food. The tasks are here, although in their minds were not mentioned. In the recent past, their duties have been defined. Amadeo, as usual, has taken care of the cemetery, while Manuel had provided the coffee, procured the coffee, and informed the relatives or friends of the deceased. The washing and laying out of the corpse for viewing had been Adelina's responsibility. Now she required of them what she had generally given to others. For different reasons, they were, they were each unnerved by the thought of a naked woman. And there, although it was not public known, had always been dispelled by the female body. And well had loved a woman in his youth, and she had loved him. And she died, but it is mainly the faithful to her memory. We prepared the birds well, Manuel said after that they had finished eating and clearing the table and were allowed to leave it for Adelina's home. They were good birds, some of them replied. I think we should do the here. Yeah. To move to questions. John moved to questions now, Felix. Yeah. If I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> we already have a question on Zoom, so I'll, I'll ask you this from a Zoom person. Yes. Um, the question comes from James. Um, James Halford. Yes. So they, they found us, I think. <laughs> so James Halford has said, um, Felix, your first three books had quite a lot of Australian material. Yes. Um, and stories from Spanish migrants in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, but Young Love is entirely set in and preoccupied with Galopia. What What is drawing you back to the village at this point in your life as a writer? Well, um, as I mentioned, one, one, uh, I'll the microphone a bit. Sorry, sorry, right, yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned, the, one of the friends of uh, Abel's, she came to Australia. When she, when the relationship finished, that's the only mark. But going back to, uh, I concentrate on the village at this time. It's a sort of beginning to the end, and the village uh, now that you disappear. My plan is that in the future, I may try to accept my experience of mine. And my life in Australia. Any questions from the audience here? Yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering whether names are important to you in the stories. Manuel needs to do with the hands, doesn't it? Like this is the labor, and he's the one who makes the coffin. Is that correct? Or so for the people on Zoom, the question was about um, names and whether names are really important. Um, Man Manuel means like physical labor. Um, are the names important to I, Felix? I think it's, uh, the Manuel is some uh, Anglo-Saxon, not a bit of a laugh with it, like uh, the Spaniard in the works from the Spanner. But Manuel is very common name. And especially in this story, Manuel, we see Manuel as an old man, we see Manuel as a, as a school boy and also a, but no. Yeah. I never think of what the name means. Any other questions from the audience? I'm keen to um, I'm keen to find out. Uh, you these books you you um, obviously uh, you work over them for a long time, yes. but they're very slim volumes, and I'm I'm very partial to uh, a thin book. Everyone's putting out these seven hundred page books now. And I won't pick one up because I know it's just, it's, there's not enough editing going on in those books, I think. 
Do you are you fond of small kind of volumes of work? Well, uh, most of my work is short stories, and I I like the discipline of story because every every word has to has to contribute to the total effect. So I eliminate eliminate until I the best the best what I want to say. Yeah. And then I what a, it's a bit hard because uh, I start with that and only need a three or four lines. It's more process. Yeah. Yeah. I know we've got a lot of poets in the audience here, and sometimes I think um, getting a, a poem down to you know its absolute um, thing can take longer than writing a um, a whole you know seven hundred page novel. <laughs> and I think the poets have a, an ability that. Uh, most of us don't have to summarize the idea, the concept for pure. If that they, they have this privilege, where the other more to <laughs> <laughs> um, Short stories might be just behind poetry in terms of its, its, its uh, succinctness. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, Freddy. Um, there's always such a there's always such a lovely sense of memory and uh, reminiscing in the stories, and you know there's the, the, the past you know still being so vibrant and alive. I'm just wondering, does contemporary life interest you as a writer as well? You know, can you imagine setting something in 2021? Yes, um, I have a long list of things happened to me in Sydney, in Melbourne, and in Brisbane. Uh, I'm beginning to get be able to go in there and convert to get into fiction. I think uh, some read somewhere memory and imagination is a, is a nice thing. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions before we get in for a signing? No? I think um, on that note, unless there's any questions from Zoom, and I'll just check. No, nope, there isn't at this point. I think that we can consider your book launched. Yay! <laughs> so welcome to Young Love Into the World. And to welcome it, we're going to get you to do a signing inside the yes. shop, aren't we, Phyllis? Did you want to say anything before we go through? or? No, I'd just to uh, thank you for coming. And as at the beginning, there are so many faces from those here who are pleased with me very much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great. And maybe, who knows, maybe I come back one day. <laughs> exactly, for the next one. And thank you very much to Melissa for doing such a great speech. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get um, Felix to his seat now. So if you want to um, come through, I can take your wine for you, Felix, so I can get your signing table. It's really cool. Yeah. 